Okay, so it looks like we still have a couple more people signing in, so we'll give it a few more minutes before we get started. All right, well, I say let's go ahead and get started. Panelists, ready? Great. So first off, I wanna welcome everyone to this evening's roundtable discussion. The title of our discussion is A Conversation on the Future of Coral Reefs in Caribbean Panama. My name is Dr. Maggie Johnson, and I'm a coral reef scientist. I'm also a researcher at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts in the United States. And tonight I'm gonna to be moderating this conversation among our experts who are gonna be talking about coral reefs of Caribbean Panama. And so first I'll tell you a little bit about the agenda for the evening and how we're gonna go about this discussion. I'll first start off with some background information about the virtual event that we're participating in, the Global Countdown. And then our panelists will introduce themselves. We'll jump into some of the most pressing topics regarding Caribbean Panama coral reefs. And we're aiming to end around uh, 6.50. So to tell you a little bit more about this global event, tonight is actually part of day two of a virtual TED event that's called Countdown. And Countdown is a global initiative that's aimed at championing and accelerating solutions to the global climate crisis with the goal of turning ideas into action. Ultimately, the plan is to try and cut greenhouse gas emissions by half by 10 years from now. The movement's open to everyone. And tonight we're speaking to you as members of the countdown as part of the TEDx San Jose de David in Panama. So this event started last night with a series of virtual talks and it's gonna to continue tonight with our discussion. And that's gonna be followed directly by another set of virtual talks. You can tune in again tomorrow night at the same time for the final day of the TEDx Panama countdown event and that's where the remaining talks will be featured. And if you miss any of those talks, you can always tune in later and I'm gonna enter the website into the chat box just so everyone has easy access to that. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. As I mentioned, I'm a coral reef ecologist. I've been studying coral reefs of Caribbean Panama, specifically Bocas del Toro since about 2016. I've been affiliated with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute which has a research station in Bocas del Toro. And I've continued my research in Panama, even though now I'm based back in the United States. And we have the pleasure of speaking with three other experts on coral reefs of Panama. So to start off, we'll get to know them a little bit better. And I'm happy to introduce you to our panelists, Till Deuce of Bocas Mariculture, Megan Chavez of Mar, Mar Alliance, and Doug Marcy of Caribbean Coral Restoration. So Megan, let's start off with you. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and how long you've been working on Panama's reefs? Hi, thanks Maggie. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Megan Chavez. I'm a marine biologist and I'm also the national coordinator for the NGO Mar Alliance in Panama. So we are an international organization and we focus on the research and conservation of large marine wildlife, specifically big fish like sharks and rays um, and big bony fish like groupers and snappers as well as marine turtles that are all typically, or many of them are reef associated species um, that are really critical for these habitats. Uh, and so our work encompasses uh, aspects that include research, scientific research. So a lot of the species in these groups are data deficient. So we don't have even basic information on their populations and their biology, uh, on their behaviors. And that really hinders our ability to conserve them and protect them and manage them. So a lot of our work encompasses um, research to get uh, baseline information, information that can be used for research for uh, excuse me, conservation and management, but 
But our work also encompasses a lot of education and outreach and capacity building. So we work a lot with artisanal fishers, um, who, as my director likes to say, have PhDs of the sea because they have so much knowledge and experience out in the ocean. Um, and we work a lot with them in order to kind of find solutions and find ways that we can kind of mitigate um, impacts on coral reefs, impacts on the fish populations, and move ourselves towards more sustainable um, management of coral reefs and their associated species. Um, so I've been in Panama, working in Panama professionally for the last five years, but uh, I am Panamanian. So I remember, remember um, as I was growing up visiting a lot of the coral reefs around Panama um, from the time I was a kid. So happy to be here, thanks. That's great, thanks Megan. Okay, Till, let's go to you. Go ahead and give us an introduction. Hello, good evening, everybody. My name is Till Deuss. I am originally from Germany. I'm a biologist and I came to Panama the first time in 2010 with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. And I came uh, again to uh, Bocas in 2011. Uh, I had a fellowship with the Smithsonian uh, working on sea urchins. And uh, I've been always been fascinated by aquariums from, uh, from child on. And I think aquariums have uh, if well done, a lot of potential for conservation to uh, connect people to nature, to get people interested in, in science. And, um, and I've been always been dreaming about uh, starting a project that helps uh, to develop a sustainable aquarium industry. And at the same time, uh, helps uh, people uh, locally to get into more sustainable alternatives than fishing. A lot of people here they live above the water and they depend on, on fishing. So we started a project to teach families, indigenous families, to uh, grow native species that are already here, uh, close to their houses, and um, by that uh, produce uh, sustainably produced uh, product uh, and uh, substitute the wild collection of uh, marine animals. The aquarium industry uh, largely still depends on the wild collection of uh, coral reef animals because uh, the techniques to make them, to culture them, to produce them uh, in captivity are still being developed. And um, yeah, so we, uh, we try to contribute to uh, locally to the conservation of the resources, but also internationally by uh, providing a sustainable product. That's great. Thanks so much, Till. Um, Okay, let's go ahead with you, Doug. Uh, uh, we've got a storm going on here, so my, my internet's oh, no. in and out, so <laughs> figures. We'll do our best. <laughs> anyway, I'm on a remote island, so that puts me on a separate, separate system, I guess. So anyway, I, I want to welcome everybody. I'm looking forward to this, have been for a long time, because I want to, uh, this exchange of ideas and, and uh, information is something that has really appealed to me. Uh, I'm the founder of uh, and the president of Coral Restoration Panama or Coral Restoration Caribbean Coral Restoration Center. And it's a tax, it's got 501c3 charity we created to assist in funding coral restoration efforts in the Caribbean about six years ago. I'm also the founder of uh, Ayuda a la Tierra, a uh, company performing coral and fisheries restoration practices. And with permissions from Panama, we're currently operating in the Bocas del Toro Archipelago. And what we try to do is focus on marine ecosystem projects that directly involve and employ the local population, economically and environmentally sustainable practices, much as the same as Till is doing. Over the past three years, we've cloned over 5,000 coral from an original collection of 250 species and re represents eight separate genotypes of staghorn coral. And our outplant program is concentrated primarily of staghorn and elkhorn coral. And our one outplant project that is not directly connected to our nursery areas is at an over 80% survival rate. In our, in our fisheries habitat redevelopment, we've created a chain of sites where there's uh, on the 15 minute corded fish counts, we've gone from a few less than a dozen in the count to over hundreds. 
and, and that includes several large predator species have returned into the area. So we've got a long ways to go, but we're, we're using applied science and common sense and, and uh, getting some pretty good results. And uh, because we're talking about coral restoration along the entire Panama coast tonight, I want to mention that I'm looking forward to working with uh, two new startups that have, are working or in the Cologne area, and that's Reef to Reef and Litton Bay Restoration and Protection. Both of these companies are working with local government agencies and they're practicing coral restoration and developing coral nurseries. And it's, in my opinion, it's these kind of unified coordinated efforts that are gonna, gonna make a difference in our near term outcome for all of what we're doing. Uh, thank everyone for the, everything they're doing with this TEDx project and hang with me. I hope maybe I'll stay with you all night. <laughs> Sounds great. Thanks so much, Doug. Okay, so let's get into coral reefs in Caribbean Panama a little bit more. Um, and before we do that, so let's start off with why people should care about coral reefs. So who wants to go with that one first? Why are they important? Why do they matter? Go ahead, Doug. Doug, do you want to take that one? I see your microphone's off. <laughs> or you're on. <laughs> okay. Well, um... The question was, how long have I been working on coral reefs? And I've been coming into the Panama area, into this area in Bocas del Toro for over 20 years now. So I've seen a lot of changes in that time frame, And uh, I've been actually working on coral restoration and uh, fisheries restoration for the last six years. Now we just started with the the coral restoration about four years ago. And um, the changes have been pretty dramatic in what has happened over that time frame. And I think anybody who's, who has been in the ocean or been around here for that long can tell you that the, yeah. what existed uh, 20 years ago is certainly a lot different than what's here now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, Dale, you want to you jump in? Tell us a little bit about why we should care about coral reefs too. Sure. Um, well, coral reefs are uh, like more or less 25% of all marine species in some part of their life cycle depend on uh, coral reefs. So, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, they are also called the rainforest of the sea, right? So they're just uh, very biodiverse uh, ecosystems, very old ecosystems. And um, we humans depend on so many ways on coral reefs, um, be it like food security, um, millions and millions of people depend on coral reefs for fishing. Um, they provide coastal protection, the, the corals break the waves. So they protect the coast from uh, big storms, big tsunamis and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, like uh, lots of human activities. Uh, tourism depends, we in Bocas depend a lot on, on coral reefs for, for tourism. Uh, also things like uh, um, fishing or um, diving tourism. And also uh, there are lots of uh, marine animals that produce bioactive compounds that we in big part don't know yet about. Mm -hmm. um, like I think sponges are a good example um, and there is a lot of potential for medicine development from coral reefs organisms. Yeah, that's great. And Megan, you focused a little bit on the, the bigger stuff on the reefs. So why do we care about those ones? The sharks yeah, and the um, charismatic ones. Yeah, I think I think Till covered it pretty well with the services that, that coral reefs provide. Um, but also, I mean, on a more personal note, just uh, the joy that coral reefs bring. I think anyone who has explored or dived on a coral reef um, knows the, the excitement and exploration that comes. And you really, you can spend probably an entire lifetime just on one reef and exploring it and still not fully understand all that it has to offer and all the species that uh, depend on it and interact with it. So I think uh, on that side, besides all the amazing ecosystem services, food security for so many communities, um, barrier protection, um, and all things that we can 
take from coral reefs, there's also that aspect of uh, just bringing a sense of joy and excitement into our lives. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's, it's important to not forget that part, right? The ecosystem in itself is inherently amazing and beautiful and we need to do what we can to protect them. So Doug gave us um, a little bit of an overview about how the time he spent working on reefs around Panama and some of the changes that he's, he's seen. Megan and Till, what about you guys? You've been working on the reefs for a long time. What are some of the changes that you've seen with your own eyes? Um, well, so for me, I can remember uh, how different the reefs were from when I, were, when I was a kid. Um, even though I wasn't collecting data, really studying them at the time, I just remember them um, looking healthier, there being many, much more fish than there are than I can see now. And just the difference in the presence of trash on reefs and beaches, unfortunately, mm -hmm. has been a big change that I've seen in the last of the last 15 years. Um, but also just working with Mar Alliance, I've been able to um, talk and interact with fishermen along almost the entire Caribbean coast of Panama and really um, understand what their experiences are and their perceptions of how things have changed. And um, something that we really, that we commonly hear is that, um, especially from the older fishermen who have, who have many decades of experience depending on reefs and, and fishing in these sites, that they're seeing drastic changes in fish populations, that um, each year it's more and more difficult to find fish compared to decades before. They have to travel further and further. Um, the fish they're catching are not as large as the individuals they would catch previously. Um, and a lot of this, I think, has to do with, um, well, there's a few different reasons that we can go into in a second with uh, fishing gear and, and fishing activities. Um, but yeah, I think that's one of the one of the reasons or one of the ways that we've seen uh, quarries change is the, the, um, the species associated with them, especially yeah. fish populations. Yeah. Yeah, I have been here for the most part of the last 10 years, and I can definitely tell that um, yeah, it's not looking good. The reefs are becoming worse every year. The bleaching events uh, are becoming more severe. Right now, the the reefs are uh, wet to like, a large part here in Bocas. And um, it's becoming less diverse. Um, I've been uh, finding quite a few species uh, when I first came here that I cannot find anymore. I'm looking for them and they don't seem to be around anymore, like lots of small species of shrimp and things like that. I've uh, always been interested in and, and looking what's here. And uh, many of them I cannot find anymore. Like um, there has been quite a while and um, especially close to town, you can tell that most reefs are severely damaged. Yeah. So what do you, what do you guys think? You're, so you have unique perspectives on different aspects of the reef ecosystem, which is one of the things that makes it so interesting to talk to the three of you at the same time. But what do you think the main problems are? And so if we're thinking specifically about, for example, Bocas del Toro or other smaller areas in Caribbean Panama, what are the, the biggest problems? Doug, you want to start? Um. I'll jump in here that uh, I think the number one thing is worldwide is temperature change in the seas. And right now, as, as Till alluded to, we're undergoing a huge leaching event here because the temperatures in the water at all depths have been close to uh, 90 degrees anywhere from 87 to 90 degrees, even down to depths as far as 60 to 70 feet. And that's, uh, that's not something that's sustainable for a lot of species and coral are certainly one of those. And then the, the number of uh, coral that have died in the last two weeks here in the archipelago is astonishing. Mm -hmm. And that's not just here. It's, so there's a lot of that going on throughout the whole Caribbean area yeah. and extending across into Indonesia even. Okay. So at coral or temperatures, one thing, overfishing is certainly a factor in the Bocas del Toro archipelago. And then 
like Till said, the closer you get to where the waters are more polluted, the worse the conditions are. So yeah. I think those are the three main things that we're facing here. Yeah. Um, I'm going to interject really quickly. So a couple of you guys have already mentioned bleaching on, on coral reefs. And if there's anyone in the audience who's not familiar with what that means. So our corals are both animals and essentially plants. They have photosynthetic microscopic algae inside their tissues. And they, they're very thermally sensitive. So we find these reef building tropical corals in the tropics and they can't tolerate a wide range of temperatures. So when it gets too warm and it stays too warm for too long, they basically spit out those photosynthetic microalgae that live inside their tissues and they turn white, which is why we call it bleaching. Um, and if they stay bleached, then typically corals, corals die, which is really sad. And we've seen increasing occurrences of bleaching across the world. And as Doug was just saying, and Till was saying, there's a bleaching event happening right now in, in Caribbean Panama. So it's pretty concerning. Um, so to go back to thinking about maybe some more local impacts, Till and Megan, you wanna chime in on what might be happening to some of the Caribbean reefs? Yes, uh, I think, uh, like Doug said, uh, the biggest one is global increase in temperature, also ocean acidification. Uh, locally, um, coastal development causes a lot of sedimentation, which uh, smothers the coral. I think mm -hmm. that's a really big one. And also, yeah, pollution, contamination, also from heavy metals, from the big container shifts, um, the dredging of the uh, channels. Um, I think all of those things, overfishing, like Doug said, is, is uh, pretty bad here in Bocas. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's, I think those are the main, main causes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I, can, I can touch a bit more on the overfishing aspect. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Definitely a factor and something that we're seeing have large impact on a variety of species. Um, and this is, it's by a combination of, of reasons, really, we're seeing just an increase in fishing pressure overall, overall over the last few years, last few decades. Um, so an increase in coastal populations, um, especially at these small communities like Bocas, which I've seen completely blow up from the time that I first visited it years ago. It's completely mm -hmm. transformed. Um, but at many sites along the Caribbean coast of Panama, but you also have introduction of and use of fishing gear types that may not be uh, as sustainable, like gill nets, um, which I believe were introduced in Panama around the 70s um, mm -hmm. and correspond to drastic decreases, decreases in our fish populations. So gill nets are really effective at catching a variety of fish um, with relatively little effort on the part of the fishermen. But unfortunately, fortunately, they're not as selective. And so you don't have um, as much of an opportunity to choose uh, fish that are more sustainable to eat and to consume or, to, or the amount of fish that you're catching. Um, so we're seeing kind of a, 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 a decrease in fish populations associated with this use of, of gear types like gill nets in many sites, including in Bogus. Okay, yeah, that's really interesting. So I guess a question that I'll throw out there is, so you've talked about fishermen and local populations that really rely on these reefs for sources of food. So how do we, how do we balance what people need now for food sources versus maintaining an ecosystem or building the ecosystem back? Well, yes. what we've... Go ahead, the, Doug. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, I was just gonna say, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a complex issue. So we kind of have to find ways that we can create a balance because, um, we want to be able to maintain food security and ensure that fishers and their families are maintaining their livelihoods. So eliminating fishing is not going to be the answer, um, yeah. but finding ways we can fish more sustainably and ultimately decrease um, fishing pressure overall. So whether that's doing things like um, increasing the value of fish that are being caught and seafood that are being caught, so that fishers get more um, money for what their for their efforts, um, or finding alternatives to fishing. Um, so finding alternatives that they can supplement their income and not rely solely on fishing uh, local fish populations. So that's something that we've been looking at in a few different sites in Panama, or what are the alternatives? What are the other skill types that, or what are other areas that we can help fishers move towards to kind of uh, decrease their, their fishing efforts on, on sites like Bocas? 
So Till, I think that that segues nicely into some of the work that you're doing with the um, alternative sources of income and things like that. So can, can you talk a little bit more about that and how that could help us take some of the pressure off of reefs? Exactly, thank you. Yes, um, so we, uh, we want to teach uh, families in the archipelago to, to uh, aquaculture uh, in the ocean, close to their houses, uh, species that are from here, from Bocas. And uh, like we said, most of those, like for example, corals and those species, uh, they uh, are autotroph to, to their uh, symbiosis with the Soxantelli, so they don't need uh, to be fed. They can, uh, they can fulfill most of their nutritional requirements by light. So it is a very sustainable way uh, uh, to culture those animals uh, in the ocean without any uh, use of chemi uh, chemicals or any food input or anything like that. And it can be done like very low tech and uh, pretty easy. So it's, I think, an uh, excellent uh, alternative uh, to fishing. And it, it's going to be transitional. Like, you know, it's also an alternative that can be done at the same time um, on a small scale um, as like people can keep doing their normal uh, daily activities and over time transition uh, from the extraction uh, of marine resources to the aquaculture. Um, we not only work with corals and related groups, um, we also uh, want to get into bath sponges. We did some experiments years ago with a permit from Arab, um, which is another organism that is found locally here and could be cultured on a pretty large scale, I think, uh, using very simple techniques and being very environmental friendly. I mean, in the end, they filter the water. Yeah, and, that's an interesting idea. Uh -huh, so we want to uh, uh, use, uh, introduce those activities and uh, try to transition uh, members of the community, of the fishing community, to um, the aquaculture of uh, native marine species. And we have been already doing that for years. Um, we got our first permit in 2014 from Arab and we started with some families. And um, we, are, we are looking to expand that and get more families involved. We also um, work with the European Union on, on, a, on a grant to uh, include more families in the archipelago. And um, we're excited for, for the future to, to, ex to expand that. And, and to um, scale it up. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's that's definitely a really interesting and unique perspective to also this way. effort to, to try to protect reefs or mitigate some of the damage. So that's that's some really cool work you're doing. Excuse me. Yeah, it's also a way to like, the idea is to, to have these people become the stewards of the reef. If they learn how to cultivate a little piece close to their houses and they know mm -hmm. that it depends on the health of the surrounding uh, reef and how everything is connected. Um, I think that has uh, a lot of potential. Okay, Doug, so you you work with corals, which are stuck to the bottom, not so much the fishes, and but you take a little bit of a different approach. So you focus on the coral uh, restoration side of things. Well, we do a little of both because uh, it, it takes a balance. Yeah that you have to have the fish to make the balance of the coral living. Mm -hmm. So, and you can't have the fish don't have any place, any habitat where they can reproduce. So you have to have some kind of a habitat and while you're hoping for the coral to reestablish uh, some, some sense of habitat for in a natural way. Yeah. So we make uh, artificial we make artificial restructures that we put in the water that then let the coral grow on that. They become a receiver for the coral larvae. So over time, they'll become part of the landscape and, and be very natural. But we have to, at the same time, we have to have somehow create a seed bank for the coral so that we can have coral developing into something that can survive these kind of conditions. And, and Till's on definitely on the right track in what he's doing to try to, to turn the, the mindset around away from the fishing into something that's a sustainable practice. 
So all of that is tremendously helpful in the big picture. And without that, without the education, without those changing in our attitude of what we do and how we do it, it's it nothing will change. Yeah. So that's yeah. it's a good teamwork effort. Yeah, no, that's great. So another I guess this is particularly relevant to Boca del Toro, which is a pretty big hotspot for tourism. So coral reefs bring in money to the economies by bringing in tourism, but there's also potentially a negative side to that. So can you guys speak a little bit to the role of tourism and coral reefs bringing in economy, but also like, how do we do that without harming the reefs? Megan, do you want to start? Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, in many sites, especially Bocas, um, many coastal communities have kind of evolved to almost fully depend on tourism, um, which has been good in a sense in some ways because they've been able to maybe take a, or, or decrease their extractive um, activities and focus more on tourism as, as their main source of income. Um, but increased tourism does, have, as you mentioned, does or can have some negative impacts. So I think... Um, as tourists or travelers, we have to realize that um, when we visit a location, especially a smaller location, small islands, that we can have a really big impact, um, especially on the resources that we use. So in the case of Bocas, um, like fresh water is a big issue that's especially been occurring the last few years, um, the, the uh, amount of fresh water available, but also the amount of waste that's generated, um, the food that's, that's eaten. So I think... Um, I think it's really important for tourists to kind of be responsible and be conscious consumers and conscious tourists. So kind of um, do some research beforehand and take a look at how, um, how the actions they're doing, what they're doing is impacting the local communities and local uh, marine ecosystems um, and looking at where you're putting your money. So what activities are you supporting? Are you supporting um, the consumption of local endangered species, or are you supporting um, non-consumptive activities like responsible diving and snorkeling and showing support for the conservation of these marine ecosystems. So I think, um, yeah, trying to be more responsible, trying to be more conscious consumers and travelers is something super important to kind of realize and take into account when we're um, talking about tourism at, at these sites. Anything else you guys wanna to add to that? Yes, I think the same applies um, to everybody else. Uh, we need to be more responsible in our choices. And yeah. especially here in Bocas, it's a, it's a small island and there used to be a lot of tourists. And um, so this actually has a, their, their behavior actually has a, of course, a huge impact. And uh, I think it's, it's important to, to remind people um, uh, to act responsibly, like um, for example, um, there is this project about the sea turtle uh, conservation here in Bocas and they have a program where you can go with the guides at night to see the turtles and they do it in a very respectful way. They stay, of course, away from the turtle and don't use lights and, and things like that. And, and of course, it's important that people um, support those kind of organizations and that they don't try to do their own thing and go to the beach at night and try to see a turtle but instead uh, do it with professionals and uh, also um, with this choice I hope that those uh, initiatives can continue. That's great I'm going to interject one quick thing here so if I didn't mention this earlier you guys can enter your questions so audience members can enter your questions into the Q&A box and those will pop up. And if we don't get to those questions while we're, we're having this discussion, we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes towards the end where we'll specifically answer those questions. So if there's anything that pops up or pops into your mind, go ahead and put it into the, the Q&A box and we'll get to that towards the end. Um, Doug, did you wanna add anything to that, to the tourism or? Yeah, only the, well, one of the things that we're doing is we're creating a, a brochure that goes to both the fishermen and to the, the taxi drivers that talk about the coral impact that the tourism has on, on the coral and, 
and what happens with the overfishing. And the, we're on the verge of being able to have some of those things be enforced in a way where there becomes an awareness. We don't want to get people in trouble. People are having enough trouble the way it is. But if people understand, and that's where the education comes in, that's where we have to make it work, is by educating enough that people understand what we're doing so in the long run, it works for everybody, including them. Yeah, that so, was great. That's, um, that's a really important point. And something we need to think about moving forward. It's a very important part yeah. of what we all do. Yeah. Okay, so we, we just talked a little bit about tourism. Um, so the last how many months that we've been in this sort of global lockdown, you haven't had any tourism in Bocas. Have you seen any or noticed Diana, any changes Diana. or differences? Yes. Yes, very definitely a difference really? in uh, and um, a, a difference in the air, a difference in the water, mm. a difference in what how the fish are reacting to the environment. It's uh, there's a drastic drop in the number of boats mm. that go up and down all the time. So, and the, the amount of affluent that is coming into the water is certainly different. That's not, it doesn't mean that it doesn't still affect the water. There's a lot, there's a ways to go. Yeah. But it certainly has been reduced in, over this time period. Yeah, it's really interesting. So that gets that gets into this idea that you know we're humans and populations are having a big impact on the local environment. But we can't remove people from it forever. Tourism is going to come back, and we have our local populations. We've talked about how Doug, you mentioned that education is important. Megan, you've mentioned uh, sustainable fisheries. So, what are some other things that people can do, people who are living in Bocas or in other places in Panama, what can people do to protect, prevent damage to reefs to, to make it better? What can we actually do? Who wants to start? Megan, why don't you start? <laughs> yeah, well, going, going on more, a little bit more about the sustainable fisheries aspect. Yeah. Um, so of course we want to, I think one thing everyone should think about is, um, decreasing or eliminating seafood from their diet if it's possible. But if it's not possible, then um, trying to do research on what, what you're actually eating. So what species are you eating? Where did it come from? How is it caught? Which seems like a lot of work. Um, but I think if, we're, if you're choosing to eat wild animals who do have finite populations, um, and many of them have uh, threatened populations, and in some cases, um, whether being poorly regulated or completely unregulated, I think it's, it's part of our responsibility to do that. Luckily, there's a lot of information available that, that can help us. Um, so there's phone applications available now that can help us decide what species are sustainable to eat um, and the best species to eat if we're gonna eat seafood. Um, and I also think, uh, as I was, I was talking about earlier, choosing activities that, are, that show that we support um, non-extractive activities or non the non-extraction of, of coral reefs that show that we support um, healthy coral reefs, healthy populations of fish, whether it's diving or snorkeling. Um, but also if you're, you know, if you're going out, if you're using boats, um, make sure your boat captain doesn't throw an anchor on top of uh, live mm -hmm. coral. Um, don't assume that your tour guide is gonna uh, know how to properly act around live corals um, and, and, and show that um, that is something that's important to you. I'm sure that's a priority um, for you for maintaining these, these corals live and, and healthy. One of the things that we were doing before the, the lockdown was we were giving guided tours through our proof of concept reef and our, uh, and our land tanks. We had coral there that people could see, people could come through and understand what, a, what coral really was because not everybody understands how it, that it's more than a rock, that that's actually live animals on there. Mm. And what you do can impact those live animals. 
So, it, and, and the kids love it. That's, uh, that's something that has really, I think, has been rewarding for us to see that the kids suddenly understand that the rocks are alive. Yeah. Tell anything you want to add to that? Yes, I think um, I agree. I think the education is of uppermost importance and many people including locally, don't know what corals are, what, how important they are. And, and uh, by learning those things and seeing how everything is connected, you also get a better understanding of your, in, your own uh, position in the world and in, in all this. And um, I think uh, we all globally need to quite radically change our lives and uh, reduce uh, greenhouse emissions and and it's also those uh, small things like um, like Doug said in his talk, uh, turn off the light bulbs and don't produce much trash and mm -hmm. uh, make sustainable choices, like Megan said, uh, about your food and in my case about your, your pets in your marine aquarium. Um, mm -hmm. Education is uh, very, very important and yeah. I think there is still a lot that needs to be done in that aspect. Yeah, for sure. That's great. Well, let's move on to a couple of questions from the audience. Thank you for those of you who've entered your questions in. So first off, Doug, if someone wants to do some coral restoration work with you, how do they participate? Do you take volunteers? Doug? Say the question again, Maggie. I sure. didn't quite catch yeah. that. Yeah, that's okay. So if there's anyone who wants to participate in the restoration work that you're doing, do you take volunteers? And if you do, how do they get involved? Uh, yes, we do use volunteers. And it depends on what the, the situation is. But we have volunteers that help clean the coral trees. And uh, we have volunteers that help clean the tanks, work with the corals themselves so that it's uh, an experience that they feel like they're accomplishing something. When we were doing out planning, that always is something that people really enjoy because then we feed them pictures of what their out plant looks like in the, as it progressively gets bigger. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So uh, yeah, volunteers are, are are very helpful, but it's more for education than it is for volunteering. Okay. So yeah, come out and we're, we'll, we'll keep you busy and teach you something and have some fun at the same time. And can people can find you on your website? Can they get a hold of you that way? Loveforthesea.com. Okay, loveforthesea.com. I'm gonna put that into the chat box right now. Um, how about Till and Megan? Do you have any ideas or thoughts on how locally involved? Sorry, can you say that again? Yeah, I think I cut out. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you guys have any thoughts about how people can get involved with either the projects that you're working on or other ones that can have a net benefit to the environment? Um, yeah, we also don't really do much volunteers. It's the same like with Doug. Um, uh, everybody is welcome to come by and see what we're doing. And I did, can give you a two, little tour of uh, our laboratory in 7th Street in Brockerstown. Um, apart from that, I think, um, yeah, it's just general things like avoiding trash and like educate people and uh, like yeah. what I said, like this adopt a coral program. I think that's that is a good idea to connect yeah, people cool. and have their, their little personal coral growing in the sea and <laughs> on, it, on it every year, they, they come back and check on it. And... I wanna mm -hmm. add that, that everybody that works at, I'm sorry, no, everybody that works at Caribbean Coral Restoration is a volunteer. We don't have any paid employees, except for the, the native people that work here for us. Okay. So we use volunteers every day. 
<laughs> nice. Um, yeah, so for us, our, a lot of our activities have been a bit interrupted thanks to, to COVID this year. Um, but if anyone's interested in, in working with us or volunteering with us, I would say go to our website, which is maralliance.org, or contact us at info at maralliance.org. Um, uh, many times we, we do need to we take on volunteers or even long-term interns, um, including students, university students. Um, and a lot of times we need not people, we don't even need people who are necessarily biologists or who are trained in, in marine biology, but people who have other skill sets that in other areas um, like mm -hmm. marketing or communications or uh, photography, things like that. So even if you're not a marine biologist, you don't have that kind of training, then um, we might be able to find a use for you in some of the work we do. Yeah, that's great. That's a really good point that it takes a lot of different areas of expertise to address this issue. Right. So they're the scientists like us. And even within the coral reef scientists, you know, Megan, you study mega megafauna, what I call charismatic megafauna until you focus on the fishes that you focus on the corals. I actually study seaweed. Um, and it's all of this collective work together that I think is really going to make the difference. And so we're the scientist side of things, but you also need the educators, you need the people who can um, communicate, who can work with business, who can do all of these different aspects. And so it's by working together that I think will really make the most headway. Okay, let's see, we've got another question. Um, do you guys have any ideas or thoughts on what the government is doing to address this issue of coral reef loss in Panama? Ooh. Well, they're allowing us to work. <laughs> and and, and uh, they are concerned, but as you know, the wheels of government in Panama move slowly. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for me to impress upon uh, the government how critical it is at this time to have them participate in what's happening in the, in the archipelago here. And in fact, in the entire shoreline of Panama, the Caribbean side of Panama. The, the, some of the species of coral, like Till said earlier, some of the things that are really very important to the, the sustainability, to the, the functionality of this reef as an ecosystem, this archipelago as an ecosystem, are being lost and are in, are in danger mm -hmm. of yeah. complete extinction. And they could be saved. The good news is that they can be saved. We can preserve the species. It's not a light bulb or a light switch, but it mm -hmm. can be done. Yeah, I, I do think that's important to remember help. too. Right, we talk about the things that are happening to coral reefs and, and these other coastal ecosystems, but it's important to remember that the changes that we make do make a difference. And so we need to keep trying. Right, so hope isn't lost. Like Doug, your the title of your virtual presentation is Im "Immersed in Hope." Is that right? <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Uh, so that's that's a good one that people can check out um, on the website, which I'm actually going to put into the chat box right now. Is there anything, any other comments, Megan, that you'd like to add before we wrap up? Uh, in general or on the government? Just in, uh, we'll, we'll go to in general. So we're, we're running up against our time limit here. So we're going to wind things down. And just if there's anything else that you want to add before we say goodbye to our audience, now would be a good time. Yeah, I think um, just to kind of echo what Doug was saying is there, there still is there still is hope for our coral reefs. Um, but it is we have to do have to think long term. Um, so this is something, these are changes and that have been occurring over many years, many decades in some cases. And so we're not gonna see changes or re reversal of those changes overnight. Um, and I also think it's important to think about when we think about the future of coral reefs, that maybe our, our what we envision may not necessarily be to bring reefs back to how they were 
decades ago that we may have to think towards kind of a new, a new way of, of um, living with coral reefs and living sustainably with uh, these ecosystems. Um, and as both Jill and Doug have mentioned, education is super important um, at all levels. Um, and a lot of the work we do involves education with fishers, but also primary school students, secondary school students, educators, um, tourists, visitors, um, legislators. So at all levels, I think that's super important to, um, to help us kind of change our, our perception and ways that we think of and way that, ways that we interact with um, marine ecosystems and associated species. Yeah, absolutely. So how about you? Yes, absolutely. I agree. And we have to keep uh, staying positive. Uh, that's the only option it has. Uh, yeah. It's, it's all pretty catastrophic, but we just have to keep positive and try whatever we can to, um, to uh, help slow down climate change, to help uh, reefs coming back or, or just survive. And um, Yes, I think um, it's it's very important to stay positive, and uh, that gives that helps you to, to get up in the morning and keep keep doing the right thing. Yeah. The technology that's being developed now and used, the methodologies that are for coral restoration are fantastic. They're amazing, and where we would normally be able to plant maybe five hundred corals in a year, people are being able to broadcast corals thousands and thousands at a time. And so as we perfect those things and change the model and improve on all that, we're, the thing we have to do now is save the seed bank. We've got to save something so that we have something that we can build on that and perpetuate. Mm -hmm. But the future does look good. It's exciting to see what happens and how fast it happens when people put their mind to it. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay, well, I think it's time for us to wrap up. I wanna say thank you to Megan, Till, and Doug. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us and to discuss some of these topics. I'll also add that you can, for the audience members, you can check out the virtual talks that are part of this global countdown event with Ted. I've put the link to that, to the website into the chat box. So you can check that out. Doug has a talk that's called Immersed in Hope that aired last night, I believe. You should be able to access. I have one that's going on live tonight that's called Our Suffocating Coral Reefs. It talks about deoxygenation on coral reefs. That you can check out and then a whole suite of other talks that focus on different aspects of Panama and Bocas and the climate crisis and what we can do to try to address these issues. So a big thank you to the panelists. Thank you for joining us and a big thank you to the audience. Um, and if you have any other questions, you can get in touch with some of us through our email addresses or through our websites. Um, and yeah, so thanks everyone for stopping by and taking the time to chat with us. Thank you, Mikey, for guiding us. Yeah. <laughs> Do it again. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Maggie. Yeah. All right, everybody. Ciao. Okay.